Suman has also joined. So we're gonna make a start. Uh, I've got Anna presenting first, followed by Naz and then Suman. And then we will have uh, Dr. Zaredin and Dr. Hassoun right at the end. And then what we will be doing is talking a little bit about lung recruitment today uh, using ultrasound, uh, as well as having a little bit of uh, uh, a revision of atelectasis versus consolidation, because I still sense that a lot of people still have a lot of confusion around it. Okay, someone would like to go last, no problems. Uh, so Anna, stage is yours, go for it. So it's a quick case today. Um, it was a late preterm, 34 weeks plus five days, a girl, um, around 1,050 grams. The GBS was a new, but there was uh, no other risk factors for infection. The culture was intrapartum. And it was a C-section because the fetal monitorization was not uh, reassuring. The baby was born well with a good APCAR score, a mild acidosis metabolic, but she was in room hair with mild polypnea. And because of the weeks, she went to the neonatal unit and I did the lung ultrasound. And, and I think here we, we can see that there is the bad sign. We yep. have the... Um, Plural line, sharp and regular, uh, predominantly A lines with some yep. B lines that you can see here. And yep. um, I think the lower uh, parts of the lung are a bit worse with more B lines. So yep. maybe a double lung point, not so well demarcated. And this is R1, and you can see also in R2 uh, the same thing with A lines predominantly here and B lines in the lower parts, but good sliding and uh, um, well aerated lung. Yep. And in R3, also the same with more compact B lines here near the liver, but uh, with A lines and good sliding and uh, uh, a well appear lung. Yep. On the left side, um, we have the heart, but we can see also good sliding with A lines and some B lines, um, uh, well appearing lung. Yep. No consolidations. And here in L2, the double lung point is more evident with the predominant B lines here in the lower parts and the A lines here. Yep. But all the lungs seems the same with um, A lines, AB profile. But the baby was in room air yep. and no respiratory distress. So I think we clinically, we can say that this is a TTN. Yep. So I think this is more a transition lung. I would agree because completely. Because the baby has no, nothing with the respiratory distress. Uh, room air, always in room air, and uh, he, he, she did well uh, the days after. And uh, so, um, how old I, is the just, baby uh, when we did the scan? It was uh, a few hours, in the first hours when she went to the unit, two hours of life, less than two hours of life. It's a very good example of lung so, transition. And I mean, it just gives you a good idea of how quickly babies can transition to kind of normal lungs after birth. Yes. Uh, I mean, there's a kind of a school of thought which kind of used to give a label of delayed clearance of lung fluid, kind of DCLF kind of clinical picture with no respiratory distress and just transitioning lung. So I, I completely agree with that. I think your images are very good quality. Uh, you've got, if we just go back to your images, Anna, just...
So it's a very, very nice picture here. Very nice smooth plural line with a great batwing sign. But I think for me, what is really beautiful about the image is up to four centimeters, you've got really good depth penetration. What frequency are you using here? Uh, 12. Yeah. And uh, 12. again, even with that frequency, this is a, a gestation was 30. Four. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So 1,000 and love. I have no so critique here. Yep. Yeah. It's very, very nice. Very nice image. Let's go to your next one. So again, a very nice double lung point. Uh, you've got the liver coming in at the bottom. The only thought in my mind is just below the ribs. Do you have a little bit of fluid there? Or is... Yeah. Yeah. But it's it's a very, very nice image. No critique. I, there's nothing for me to say. I think, yeah, you know, you can make a very clear... The, the probe is parallel. So the challenges of coming to R3, as usual, because you kind of in the top half of the axilla. So often the plural line does appear a little bit blurred because getting that alignment with the probe can be a little bit difficult. But again, uh, you've got some compact B lines coming in and out with respiration. Uh, I think a transitioning lung, and this is the point that Dr. Liu makes about the, the transition of transient echidna is that the upper lung fields tend to get aerated more quickly as compared to the lower lung fields. So you tend to see double lung points generally in the re resolution phase. So very good image, yep. And then you've really nicely taken the heart out of the way there coming medially and uh, again, uh, you can see a, a dominant A profile in the top half, but the lower half of the lung looks wet. So kind of a double lung point appearing, heart coming in the way, but very, very well made image to get the heart out of the way. Then we just get a little bit more wet. So very nice double lung point that you can see there with A lines and A lines all the way down. So classical, uh, I'd say the bamboo sign appearance that we normally describe. So. <clears throat> yep, I I agree with your diagnosis, and there's very little that I can actually tell you to improve here. I uh, I think it's a beautiful image. So just for everybody, what we're aiming to do is we we kind of coming to the third month, and now some of the focus will focus a little bit on theory, as we add additional chapters. But more importantly, over the next three months, what we want to be able to get you to do is get you to be able to critique and review about 25 of your scans each. And I've been having a look at your logbooks and a lot of you, some of you got up to 19 scans, some of you got 16. And then we've got a few of you who've got two or three. And the only problem with the two or three is I can't give you your L1 certificates. But if you can get up to 25 scans that we've peer reviewed and from next weekend onwards, we'll be starting peer reviews using the OSAD tool. So. I'd be signing them off and actually storing them in your logbooks, which is a critique of where you can improve. Now, individually, what I'd say is that what you really want to be able to focus on is image optimization now, because you've all, at least everybody who's presented, are demonstrating good amounts of anatomy. And uh, artifact is the better word. So I think in terms of recognition uh, and being able to present a variety of differential kind of conditions, clinical correlation, everybody's achieved that. But the step ahead is for some of us, we've kind of achieved a really good level of image quality. And again, with some of the sessions that we're doing at the moment, you're going to see the step up in image quality. And I'm just going to show you some of the images that I've taken uh, a few years back and try to get you to image optimize. But here, Anna, you've got some very good images. There's nothing I can suggest. For me, the fact that you've got a uniform appearance right down to four centimeters, and you're describing the the, the artifact right up to that point, it's 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 amazing. My congratulations. Do you have another case? No, just okay. this. Okay. Naz, are you able to go? Yeah. Um, can I present two cases? Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, no problems. I'm just going to close. Okay. 
So the first one is um, it's a bit of a it's an interesting case because it gave a diagnosis of something unexpected, and I thought it'd be nice just to share that. So um, it, this was a term 38 weeker, 3.5 kilo baby. Um, there's history of maternal group B streptococcal in, uh, in the mom's urine and, and there was from um, spontaneous rupture of membrane for 30 hours. So as for our septic screen, this baby qualified to have a partial septic screen as for the NICE guideline. This baby didn't require any resuscitation at birth, was otherwise really well, no respiratory distress, nothing. So. As for protocol, uh, once you make a decision, which was at birth, to um, get the baby on the neonatal unit and put a cannula in, start antibiotics. Um, I'm giving a background because this is really funny and interesting, is that, um, so while the cannula was being put, it was being put in the right hand. So our nurses, as part of the sepsis protocol, is to do a set of ops. This was at five o'clock in the morning. They wanted to hand over, finish everything. So decided uh, to put it on so the leg. Just uh, Naz, I think we've yeah. we kind of lost your audio. I can hear you. So can okay. other people? Can other people hear me? I can hear you. Yes, I can hear, Naz. Can hear you. And I can okay. hear you. Yes. Okay, amazing. That's great. And Naz, That's... we don't have your screen share. Am I correct? Sorry, you don't have my screen. No, so no. I can see you, but we can't I'm see sure. the screen. We can see the screen. Yeah, we can see background. Can your, see your, slide. your slide hasn't moved since background. Yeah, yeah, I'm at the background. Oh. I'm just giving. I'm sorry, I'm giving a horrible spiel. But essentially, this baby came for septic screen. It was noticed to have a pre-ductal saturations of 95% and a post-ductal saturations of 88%. Um, so the team tried giving oxygen and um, it didn't make any difference. The baby was very well, good femoral pulses, normal heart sounds, good hemoglobin nothing essentially. So they called me in basically to come and review this baby. So I scanned this baby at four hours of age using a 10 hertz linear um, scan probe. Um, so this is on the L1 and as you can see there's um, nice pleural margins and good pleural sky sliding, um, mainly um, A profile um, with some um, B lines coming through, which could essentially be considered as an A profile and normal thought. Um, and then on L2, I seem to have lost in between, but again, very clear um, A profile with some B lines um, coming through. Um, and then on L3, um, you do have um, um, B uh, again, very good lung sliding, nice thin pleura, um, mainly A lines, but there's some B lines coming through. I'm not sure if these are dynamic air bronchograms, which I can see over there. Um, and then on L4 again, very, very similar to the previous ones. Again, mainly an A profile, some B lines coming through. Yep. Um, and then at the back as well on the left side, um, it's obviously we flipped the baby over, so it's a little bit more dense over here, but still you can see um, good plurals um, sliding and um, there are A profile essentially over there. Um, and then lower down as well, again, interestingly seems to be better A, lots of A lines essentially coming up over there. Hmm. Um, On the right side, um, so this was more trickier and more difficult over here. Um, you do see a bit of um, lung sliding, but actually the heart was coming. Heart, yeah. Do you have a dextrocardia? Yeah. Do you have a dextrocardia? <laughs> that's the first thing that came to mind is whether you have a dextrocardia because you've got a heart that's coming in R1 and that's uh, you know kind of interfering with your image. So, well, that's a great pickup on the ultrasound. Yeah. <laughs> It was an um, interesting pickup on a lung ultrasound to do this. Um, uh, and you can see the same thing um, on you just the heart is just coming in the way, actually. Um, and even on the, um, the even on the axillary side, actually, so mainly an A profile, but then again, some B lines. So essentially, it seemed a 
more transitioning. You could see the liver actually on that side with the nice yep. duct over here. So actually it wasn't a situs inversus on the lung ultrasound on this, but there was clearly dextrocardia over here. Um, so, um, and even on R5, you could actually see the heart coming in yeah. over there. But on the lung ultrasound wise, nice fluid sliding, mainly yeah. A profile over there. And on the R6 as well, again, very similar. What's the frequency of your probe now? 10, 10 yeah. hertz. I should probably come down a little bit, I think, to 8. Maybe. You could do. Yeah, you could do. And uh, that might just give you a little better depth on the R6. The challenge with the back is always you get a lot of tissue. Uh, in the way, which kind of interferes then with basically what we call is penetration of sound waves. So you tend to lose your depth. And one option is you can use what we call a spatial gain, or it's called tangential gain in some machines. Uh, the, the, the gain basically in your machine will either be horizontal gain, or it will be vertical gain. And really what that allows you to do, it brings up the screen and it lets you put out the gain in the lower half of the image if it's horizontal. Vertical is a little bit more challenging because it, it will kind of be from left to right. How would so, I do that? So uh, uh, a good way of doing that is like uh, me and Kenaz did this last week with her. So we can set up a, a call over bottom where you can show me your machine and I can take you through it. So. I am, I'm gonna be on annual leave the whole of next week. Uh, and from Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, take your pick any day that you're free anytime. And this is offer to everybody, anybody who wants to do a little bit of one-on-one -on -one peer review with their machine image optimization nobology. I'm very happy to kind of uh, look at your machine over uh, bottom and then just give you a little bit of advice on how you alter the tangential or the spatial gain depending on you have a GE so for the GE machine that you actually use it is going to be vertical gain which is a little bit challenging but it allows you to kind of put the gain up in vertical kind of lines but other than that your image is a very nice plural sliding seen very very well and I mean you've made a very nice diagnosis and this is the beauty of focus you know it's uh, absolutely amazing my congratulations yep yeah, so we did the x-ray after doing the ultrasound, which is good. It's worth a case report, Naz. Uh, it's it worth is, a case yeah. report. You have the images and, you know, there's uh, the Journal of Ultrasound Medicine would very much, you know, you're making a diagnosis of ultrasound, of dextrocardia using a lung ultrasound. I'm not sure that I've seen it reported in the literature. I would, I would strongly echo you might have a case report there. Yeah. So I'm just giving everybody a small feel of focus. So I have uh, about eight years back, done an echo on a baby uh, to look at situs. And uh, we did the echo to basically assess the duct, which was massive, started some paracetamol uh, and uh, basically re-echoed the duct three days later. And unfortunately, I could not get a view of the situs view uh, or the uh, aorta, uh, nor uh, you know the, the relation of the aorta. Uh, and it was just completely fuzzy. And the first thing that came to mind for me is if you, if you get nothing and it's dark is whether you have air there. And if you have air there, the question is whether you have a perforation. So we did an X-ray and we had a perforation. So just, uh, it's interesting how ultrasound physics can really help. And this is a really nice example of how, you know, you're using point of care ultrasound to make a, a diagnosis without a chest X-ray. So well done. We can go to your next one, yeah. So the next one is um, a 27 plus four week, uh, um, a one kilo baby who there was um, spontaneous rupture of membrane for five days and there was anhydramnios. Um, mom was steroid mature, but she hadn't received any magnesium. There was cord and hand prolapse. So it was an emergency C-section done. The baby um, it was one fairly reasonable, had delayed cord clamping, but then required inflation, ventilation, breaths, um, was intubated at six minutes, given Curacef, um, 200 per kilo. Um, and then we I've done two scans, so scan just before extubation at four hours of age, and then we did another scan at 17 days later so you use 12 hertz linear scan probe um, for both times so on this is at four hours of age um just before we were going to extubate this baby so um again 
on the R1 and R2, just really good lung sliding. Actually, very much in A profile, you do have B lines coming through, but it looks really good like an A profile coming there. And on the R2 as well, um, again, really good lung sliding. Um, and there is um, A line seen with lots more B lines being seen, but not as confluent still. I'm not sure what is this, which I keep getting up in my and seeing them in my previous scan. I don't know if it's just lost. Um, Naza, I'm just going to get you to just stop just for a sec. Yeah. Sorry. Nausea. Yeah. So, um, and then in R3, um, the pleural looks a little bit more thickened, and so these were subpleural consolidations sitting then possibly yeah. shred sign there. Um, uh, again, but I don't think there's shred sign there. I think they're just subplural consolidations. So the reason you're losing out on the deep part of your image at this particular point is you're not getting depth penetration of sound waves. So actually that is kind of a dead area. And what you might have to do is your frequency you were using was 10? 12, it's a 27. Yeah, so you might just have to drop your frequency just a little bit, just to kind of, I mean, ideally you're right. You're, you should be able to penetrate very nicely if it's a 27 weaker. Uh, it's a little bit unusual for you to get a complete blackout in that region. So what I would suggest is just trying to drop your frequency and playing with it. And the only other thing that you can do is, do you have an eye gain setting on your, okay, no worries. Let's, let's try and chat next week when you have some time to have a look at your machine. My only worry is you're losing out on the deeper kind of uh, artifact that will give you some information. Yeah. Superficial bits are very, very well demarcated.
Um, and again, in R4 as well, um, slightly thickened pleura, but good lung sliding, more yeah. um, B lines coming in through, but you do have, still have some A lines as well. Sure. Um, on the left side, the, the heart keeps coming in the way, but again, um, good pleural sliding. Um, do you have A lines and some B lines coming yep. through yep. over here? Yep. I don't think on the LT you can comment anything besides there's a heart. And the thymus. So you can see the thymus in the left upper quadrant there. Just that. Eh? that so uh, no. So if can you see that rectangular area just above the heart? That is. That is thymus. Okay. And you can see that in L1 as well. And what, what you've, uh, the challenge you have when you come down to L2 and the heart's coming in the way is you have to just angulate medially because actually what you can see to the left of your screen in L2, so just below the thymus is actually lung. And you've got one B line that's coming in there. Now, okay. again, when you look at L1 to the left, what is happening is that as you move deeper, you get these horizontal kind of reverberation artifacts. What we need to do is we just need to drop your frequency a bit. Just there to get a little bit more clarity. So, if you're using a frequency of 12, play with it. Go maybe go down to 11, 10, and that'll give you a little bit better in terms of your depth penetration. Now, the GE, you've got your focus again at the level of the lung. Now, if your focus is at the level of the lung, it's not going to give you as clear images deeper down. So, if you just want to move your focus down, maybe whilst you're looking at the deeper images to give you better delineation. And you might have to save two images, but those are just the few tips that I can give you to kind of image optimize. But I would agree, a dominant A profile in L1, the occasional B line that's moving through, I think the heart coming in the way you've done very um, And then um, L3 was more of a, um, again, good, Pleural sliding, but more of a B profile yeah. being there. Um, are these what you're seeing over here? Are these dynamic bronchograms? It's very difficult to tell. They're not bright enough for me to be dynamic bronchograms. My gut feeling is you're just seeing artifact over there with the sound that's giving you a slight difference in the image intensity below the pleural line, which varies. For me, this is a dominant B profile. You don't see any A lines. You see on the right side of the screen, compact B lines. And uh, basically what looks like spleen probably coming in at the bottom. But again, as the baby inspires, the lung and the pleura moves and you get a, a B profile just above the spleen. But as you come to the middle, that area that looks dense, uh, it, uh, it's very tricky. It's not bright enough for me to say that they are dynamic air bronchograms at this particular point. Uh, are you using a sharp mode by any chance? You're not using a sharp mode. Okay. And uh, just uh, in terms of kind of, you you must have an eye gain function or an auto gain function because the auto gain will help basically make the gain uniform throughout the sectors. And again, the deeper part of the, the, the lung we're losing out on. So those are things that we can definitely work on. But yeah, dominant B profile, slightly unusual considering. So how old is the baby? Baby is four hours old. Okay. So you have transitioned oh. more on the right side anteriorly. Uh, left side looks wet uh, in the L3. Yep. Um, I don't have um, the back. Is, uh, the nurses are not very keen on me flipping the baby. No, or... That's understandable. Yep. Um, very... So this was the x-ray done. So actually we... The aim was to extubate this baby as soon as the baby came to the unit. The baby looked clinically stable, but we wanted, I wanted to put a long line in. So we waited actually for four hours, basically, till we get stabilized the baby and then put the long line in and then extubated the baby. So even on the x ray, it just um, shows RDS. Yep. Um, and then um, at 30 weeks, so three weeks later, approximately, um, baby was fully fed. Um, on donor milk and breast milk fort file and on vapor therm of four liters per minute. So I had tolerated extubation to high flow and then um, to CPAP and then vapor therm. Um, and I was weaning off the vapor therm. So um, this is um, the L1 
which seems mainly a B profile, yeah. the heart in the way, but mainly a B profile over here on um, L2. I think it's just a very bad image, but there is um, crudel sliding and some, and there's some A lines and some B lines coming through. Yep. Um, and then on L3 as well, again, good crudel sliding, um, but again, mainly a B profile of them coming through. Yep. Um, and similarly on the L4 as well. How old is the baby? 17 days old, so 30 weeks now. Yep. Um, L5, um, again, good fluid sliding, um, but um, lots of B lines coming through. Um, interestingly, L6 had more A lines um, there with very few um, uh, B lines um, coming down that way. Um, yep. On the right side, again, mainly a B profile, um, just lots of coalescent B lines coming yep. down. Um, and then on R2 as well, very, very similar. Um, and then R5, R6, the baby was prone and then we had put the baby supine as well. It had been 15 minutes, so therefore I think the R5, R6 is a more of an A yeah. with um, uh, B lines coming through, but mainly more of an A profile. And again, very similar in the R6 as well. Again, I'm losing a lot of depth in a way as well. So the main critique for me uh, from the previous images a your gain settings are on the lower side and needs to go up because my gut feeling is actually in this image if you had higher gain settings your depth penetration would have been good and you would have because i can see b lines virtually all the way down up till three centimeters and then it yeah. becomes very dark so we just need to push your gain settings up and then when you push the gain settings up if you feel you're having drop out in the region beyond it's kind of just dropping the frequency a little bit to get a little bit better depth penetration and or taking your focus down to about that three centimeter area to kind of get a feel for what you're seeing over there. But in terms of interpretation, I mean, I can see plural sliding very easily with predominantly A profiles in R5, R6 because this baby most probably was uh, prone at this particular point. Uh, I mean, it looks a little bit like evolving chronic lung disease at this particular point. How much oxygen... In air. In air. Interesting. Actually has, and, come off, actually has come off at 34 weeks, came off oxygen and has been in air. Actually and, came off. And when you did the scan, this baby was in air with no respiratory support? Four liters, four liters vapor thumb. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, that's the, the, the beauty of lung ultrasound is that some of the changes that we're seeing, and you might remember that from my talk, I said, there's a real probability that we might have to alter the definitions of evolving lung disease, especially uh, based on gestation. And one of the classical problems that we have is we try to define chronic lung disease for preterm babies between 22 and 32 weeks the same way, but actually there's a completely different spectrum of bronchopulmonary dysplasia you know, for babies under 26 weeks, even for the babies I'd say 28 to 32 weeks are a completely different spectrum. And uh, that's where I, I suspect in due course, you know, lung ultrasound will in a big way help delineate phenotypes uh, uh, based on this to kind of say, well, are we going to call this chronic lung disease? Are we going to call this evolving lung disease? But very nice images. Uh, just few messages. I think at a time that's convenient for you, if you're on your unit, let's try and see if we can sit down, have a look at your machine and just have a play around it. The way to do that is to consent a parent and basically say that we're, we're gonna have a look at the images uh, and explain to them exactly what you'd be doing because it'll be for training purposes. So the best way to do that is to take a baby that's normal. And we, we can practice image op optimization on that. Um, would the next weekend be okay with you? Yeah. So like I said, uh, from Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and this is an open offer to anybody who can get consent and feels that uh, they're happy. Uh, I'm happy to work around you because I will be free those four days. 
we've got strike over here as well on Monday to Friday. So hopefully Saturday, Sunday would be better. No problems. Thank well you. done. Thank so, you. I'm going to get Suman. Suman, do you want to present? Hello. Hi, Suman. Would you like to share your screen? Yeah, just a I'm just making some notes for everybody as we move along. Very nice, we can see your screen. Is it visible? Yes, it's visible. Thank you, Suman. And can you hear me? I can hear you as well. Yes. Okay. Is that okay? Yes, visible and audible. Right. So good evening, good afternoon all. So I'm presenting today one case. Uh, this was a case of a respiratory distress. Uh, this was an outborn unit, born at term gestation, uh, 3000 grams, and was referred to us for respiratory distress, mild respiratory distress, and uh, uh, peripheral cyanosis. The referral note said that the baby was not maintaining uh, saturation, and they had given CPAP. So at the admission in the casualty, uh, baby did not have much distress, though senesis was prominent. On examination, baby's umbilical cord was meconium There was The history was not uh, uh, con conclusive or supportive, but neither a referral note. Uh, so the baby was admitted uh, and baby remained okay for another 10 hours or so. After that, baby developed respiratory distress and FIO requirement went up. Um, clinical examination, uh, there was a right-sided chest uh, inflated and so uh, translimination was done uh, and that came to be positive. So at that point of time, um, we did an ultrasound with uh, uh, sonocyte machine, uh, gen mod at 10 hertz. Uh, posterior zones uh, I have not done. Uh, so, sorry, it's not here. So this is uh, R1. Yep, very nice. Yeah, the, it looks like A profile, little sliding, well Beautiful. Uh, sliding. Agree completely. Uh, your gain settings need to go up, Suman. Right, right. Yeah, uh, I think I will be the next image. I have yep. a few R2, more. you've got, so can I just say, did you make any changes in the gain or was it gel that you applied? No, uh, I, I made changes. You made changes in the gain. Yep, lovely. Yeah. Well done. So moving on to the next one. Um, because we had this prior idea that there is this distress and transmission sign was positive. So I did uh, uh, a little bit more efforts. And here you see uh, the pill siding is here and here yep. there is no sliding. This is a long point here. Yep. Uh, this is, both of these are R1 and yep. on M1. While on this image, it was not that clear as barcode. This one is looking more uh, clear. Uh, though I feel that there is this transition occurring from uh, uh, CB sign to barcode. Uh, uh, I don't I would, think, uh, not in the upper slide. So just the upper slide, mm -hmm. I, I think you've got a classical seashore sign that's got basically mm -hmm. what you've got is some lung pulse. So it, 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 the, mm -hmm. those small areas that you see, of right. incongruence, uh, uh -huh. basically of what you call, they're called T lines, or uh, they they've basically represent lung pulse. That's a barcode sign. Whether towards mm -hmm. the right of that image, 
sorry, my apologies, the seashore sign, whether towards the right yeah. of that image, just about starting to transition is the uh -huh. real question that I would ask. Uh, Where but, the line is? Yeah, yeah, just, okay. you know, I, and what would be really helpful is to be able to see that in real time. And the reason I'm just raising that is because all your T lines disappear as you move towards that area as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And then like in R1, you've got a classical barcode sign. Absolutely no doubt about it. The challenge okay. that you've got, uh, like when I look at R1 at this particular point is you don't have what is the classical bamboo appearance. Uh, mm -hmm. That feeling is because... Uh, what about you, this uh, R1 here? Uh, so, I think it is got truncated. Probably this side there was some bamboo. Yeah, so because you're using, you're using a pencil probe, aren't you? So you're using a hockey stick, right? No, no, no. This is a linear probe. So your footprint for the linear probe is very small. I'm not even getting two intercostal spaces. And that is the challenge here, that because mm -hmm. you're using them. So like when I look at R1, which is the image in the middle, can you just put okay. yourself on R1? So you can see lung sliding on either side of what is called uh, with no lung sliding in between, where you've got that right. yellow line. Yep. Right. But I cannot see A lines at all. And my gut right. feeling is, A, you're not completely perpendicular because the pleura is kind of sliding in a slight slant. So, so you're absolutely right because I was trying to uh, freeze the image and I was just, yeah. Uh, yeah, my hand got uh, unstable. Yeah, so and that's why you're not getting the, the A lines completely. And my advice is like when you're saving images, it's the hand right. stillness. So holding the probe, there's right. uh, uh, most of us when we hold a linear probe, we tend to hold right. it from the top and we lose that hand stillness. And really what I'd like you to do is try practicing holding it right from the bottom so that you can actually right. keep it near the surface of the skin. So I right. would agree there's no plural sliding in between, mm -hmm. but I can't see what is classically an A dash profile. Mm -hmm. My gut feeling is when you look at R1, you probably mm -hmm. do have an A dash profile because I can see some A lines in the middle but you're losing out because mm -hmm. your transducer again what's your frequency it's nine hertz and this is a term baby this is a term baby uh, if you could see the previous slide there i could see the bamboo sign and this is to do it as, as you said uh, unstable hand um that that i haven't got the depth here yeah. but you definitely have a barcode sign there in r1 so you know my gut feeling is you've got what you call is classical air pocket and air bubble between two areas yeah. where you have sliding. So a very small pneumothorax anteriorly, possibly. Actually, actually to tell you the background, yeah. initially I did not get this pneumothorax, but I had this strong suspicion. So I did it again. Uh, and finally I could find that. Mm -hmm. So the previous image that I showed you in the next, like, previous slide, that was the first image. This, sure. this one I got. Yeah. So I got few more images, but I haven't shown you here. Um, there are uh, quite a few of them in the series. Okay, uh, do you have them? I have, but I haven't shown it here. Yeah, because here, like, this is very nice. Uh, this so is can... R2 again. Okay, so did you want to but describe here it? you can see the bamboo sign. Here. Yep. And here again, that lung point. Sliding is uh, very clearly visible over here, and then it is not sliding that well here. Yeah. And this was the corresponding uh, M mode. Yep. And I would give it to the left of that, you've got I, I mean, you've got a barcode sign there, no doubt about it. Right. Right. Your right. gain settings can go up, definitely. Right. So when you look at R2, you, you've got your bat sign. You've got mm -hmm. basically the right-sided plura moving with B lines. Then you've got this area in the center, which is not moving with a dominant A profile. So you've actually captured it here, but you also have truck sign. So right. yeah, very nice. Yeah. Very good. So sir. maybe R1 I could have improved, but R2 looks... Nice. Yeah, yeah. So uh, this uh, left lung profiles are not; <clears throat> they they are all normal. A profile, just for the uh, details. So uh, this was our case. These are the X-rays. Um, this was the X-ray we got at that time point, and you could see this pneumothorax over. It's there. a massive pneumothorax. Yes, yes. So was there a significant time between when you did the ultrasound and the x-ray? Maybe. No, um, incidentally, I was there when this thing occurred. And so x-ray and uh, ultrasound occurred, occurred almost the same time. Maybe a gap of uh, an hour or so. 
yeah an hour will make a big difference because but uh, it, it doesn't yeah, look yeah. as if you have such a large pneumothorax on your ultrasound okay yeah it didn't look so so that is why i was uh, curious to go back again and see yeah and so this is what i found and um uh, when we inserted the ict and this is the next x ray after insertion of ict yep this one and the pneumothorax was drained excellent so it was a little bit surprising for me that i could not pick it up though this this uh, this was this massive no, my my uh, my gut feeling is that when you did it you might have had a smaller pocket of air now mm -hmm. in an hour you know you can have especially was this baby ventilated or on positive pressure no when pneumothorax occurred it, baby was in cpap later yeah. on baby had to be intubated yeah. uh, but uh, uh, baby uh, we had already got the transfusion sign positive at that point of time. Sure. Clinical suspicion was already pneumothorax. Yet ultrasound wise, I was not able to pick up. But uh, later on, uh, when I repeated, I could see them. And uh, to tell you frankly, it was just after inserting inserting the ICT, the uh, drainage. That's unusual. I mean, such a large pneumothorax should be yeah. picked up. Yeah. But keep practicing. I think that's, you know, the dictum is keep practicing. Right, right. Definitely got uh, some signs. If there's, so, and again, we'll be talking about lung recruitment today. Uh, right. And a very important aspect of lung ultrasound in situations like this is a lung ultrasound done at one particular point of time is like a chest X-ray. It's telling you what the artifact with image generation is at this point of time. In terms of what can happen in a time period, I'm giving you a very simple example to say that I've done a lung ultrasound in a baby who has respiratory distress on CPAP, which basically looks like transient tachypnea. But mm -hmm. you repeat the exact same lung ultrasound half an hour later because the baby has more respiratory distress and the baby has now developed a pneumothorax. So it's very dynamic. And really, mm -hmm. you can have changes very, very quickly. If you're on positive pressure and you have a pneumothorax, you know, uh, it's uh, mm -hmm. something that can evolve very, very quickly. Sometimes it takes a little bit more time. So sometimes you have mm -hmm. to do serial scans, but say for lung mm -hmm. recruitment that I'll describe today, you have to keep your probe there to actually see how things are changing. So, but well okay. done, I'm glad. And uh, thank, thank you for demonstrating thank you, that. Thank you. Uh, we've got Dr. Zaradin. Would you like to share your slides, sir? Yes, I, I would love to, thank you. I'm very grateful. Yeah. Can you yep. see my screen? Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, so I have one case to present, and uh, it's a, a short one. And uh, there is one learning point that I will share with you at the end of the of the uh, presentation. Uh, so this is um, this is a, a preterm baby born at 33 weeks and four days gestation with a birth weight of 2.5 kilos. There was a history of uh, Premature prolonged rupture membrane for two days. Uh, baby had um, uh, typical signs of RDS. So we received high flow uh, nasal cannula uh, initially, and then he went on to um, develop worse signs of RDS, where he earned himself uh, to be intubated, ventilated, and surfactant on day one. Uh, then baby uh, was only ventilated for one day. Eventually, he went back on high flow nasal cannula and he remained on that for four weeks. He was very slow to improve with tachypnea uh, persisting uh, in most of the times. And it was really, really getting better in a very slow pace. Eventually, he, uh, he was off the high flow nasal cannula. And obviously, the plan was put in to... Uh, discharge him from the hospital he's even he was even rooming in with the mother for one night but then 
the mother as well as the staff, they were concerned about the, again, the ongoing tachypnea, which uh, appears to be getting worse. That was at the age of six weeks when he was about to go home. Um, he had a, a chest X-ray done because of that as part of the check for this tachypnea. And uh, our radiologist, uh, he reported the uh, chest X-ray as consolidation on the right uh, side of the lung. He had a, a normal CRP and uh, uh, obviously it was a dilemma as he was about to go home and now he ended up with a uh, abnormal chest X-ray report and this ongoing tachypnea, which uh, in fact, this tachypnea has never gone away since, since uh, uh, maybe birth, mm -hmm. but it was just getting worse as he was getting ready to go home. At that point, I did the lung ultrasound scan. And that is really my point. I'm just, uh, um, and I'm sorry uh, that I'm reversing the order of putting That's the right. chest six first because the scenario actually, um, it, it's, it's a bit different yeah. where I, I'm, I'm using the lung of the pound scan to make a decision, to make a, a clinical decision to be honest. And uh, trying to even challenge the report of the chest X-ray, which is made by the radiologist. Um, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to do this, but I was just uh, trying to. So this is uh, uh, R1, which is showing, um, Nice pleural sliding with um, uh, some comet tails and a profile, and I was honestly, especially on the right side, I was uh, hoping that I would put the probe and I would see very, very typical signs of consolidation or a shred sign where I would be relieved. But the R, oh, sorry, this is R three. I think I missed R three. It's all right. But uh, R3, again, pretty much similar findings on R1 and R2. And I'm just going to move on to the next. And this is R3 as well. You can see the occasional tachypnea um, that, um, uh, that is a part. Uh, this baby now, when the scan was done, was not on any. Uh, breathing support. He was just uh, breathing spontaneously on his own with maintaining sats, but the, this on and off tachypnea or tachypnea of a borderline nature. Yep. So to me, it looked, Oops, looked normal. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then moving on to the back. Um, please note that I, I did the R5 and R6 or the posterior views on the right and the left. First, because he was on a, on a on his tummy on his uh, on a prone position uh, when I started doing the scan and has been for a while. So these are the first images to be done. Just for the sake of the presentation, I went in the systemic way. So again, R five and uh, R six showing pretty much uh, a pre predominantly a profile with normal plural sliding. Uh, with some comet tails, but no other abnormalities. Then moving on to the left side. That's L1. Um, beautiful A profile with uh, plural sliding and comet tails. Uh, then L2. Um, again, it's uh, mainly... Uh, a profile with yep. comet tail. And I'm not sure if this is the diaphragm, though, where my. Is that, is that the heart? It's not the heart, is it? Uh, probably. It looks like. Yes. It would kind of be where the heart would come in. It could be the diaphragm as well with the spleen. Uh, it, it could be because you're in the lower zone, but I would yeah. agree that. L1 and L2 look normal. Yeah. yeah. We'll go so, through all your images and then we'll just talk a little bit about maybe image optimization, but let's go through everything. Yeah. 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 So L3, again, uh, plural sliding with a very, very occasional, perhaps with um, expiration, maybe there is some uh, 
B profile intermixing with the A profile, but it's predominantly A profile in my yep. in my view. Yep. Uh, Agree. And that's uh, L four as well, uh, or a sliding, and A profile. And finally, the posterior images, and that is the L five. Beautiful. Yeah, very uh, nice. The sliding in and the uh, A profile, and then L six again. It's mainly A profile, perhaps a bit of a, a B profile every now and then with the breaths, but uh, that's only uh, very brief on maybe exhalation. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I was. Uh, these are the images, and thank you very much. And that that was my only learning point that I wanted to really uh, demonstrate by this case is that uh, when I uh, came to see this baby, I was either going to go around down the uh, path of treating this baby for pneumonia, uh, starting antibiotics based on the the kipnia and the X-ray findings or the report X-ray report uh, to be precise or to uh, uh, maybe benefit from the new skill of lung ultrasound, uh, even at, at its a very novice level. Uh, and I was very glad to uh, make that conscious decision of not to treat and just to go for a conclusion that this lung is normal. And uh, the comments on the report about the right side of consolidation maybe are, are not exactly precise. Sure. Thank you uh, so much. I would agree, and I think you've clearly demonstrated what looks like a completely normal lung to me. We'll just go to your right-sided images. Here we are. On this left. Still... So a very nice image. Uh, definitely from my perspective, the top three centimeters, very well visible. And then you can see intermittently as the baby inspires, you can see A-lines right to the bottom. Uh, again, gain could go up a little bit just to give you a slightly brighter image. And uh, what I'd say is that five centimeters, I think four would be sufficient to give you the, the meat. And mm. actually, because you'd be focusing on a smaller area, you'll get a much better image. So don't hesitate to drop your depth a little bit. Uh, right. Despite that, I would say, I think I've got what looks like a complete bamboo sign profile with you know basically pura that's sliding uh, lovely bat wing uh, the soft tissue at the top so the, you know these these look completely normal your deeper images for r5 r6 considering this is the back of the baby are very nice because you're actually getting up to 4 centimeters of penetration it's the r1 r2 should we just have a look at the r1 r2 images yeah, the yeah. r1 r3 Just go back again. Yeah, no problems. Here we are. I won. Yeah. So, yeah. So again, just we're just losing slight of the the depth for the deeper part. And my gut feeling is you could actually come down to four and uh, put your gain up, and your gain going up will basically give you the depth much better. So yeah. on your you're using a sonar side. Do you have an eye gain okay. function? Uh, there is a gain function, yes, uh, on the side of the screen, yes. But um, does, do you have an auto set? Uh, it, you can still um, you can still play with the gain, but it's usually it's a preset uh, setting. Yeah. You choose. And... So what you can do with the preset setting, and again, very happy to have a call, is sometimes preset settings don't allow you to change. So in the G, what we normally do is if I want to change a preset setting, I will just press on the probe setting. And actually what it then lets me do is change the frequency depth and gain. So it's worth having a play with that. And or the other option is to get one of your texts to come in to kind of let you have a, a setting maybe with a slightly lower frequency that lets you get a little bit better depth. Most Sonosite machines have what you call, it's called an eye gain. An eye gain basically means 
that when you take your probe, you gel it and you place it in contact, it will automatically try and adjust the gain to give you the best image. And then what you can do is with the contact on, if you press I gain, it will automatically adjust your gain to give you a uniform image. So if it's not there, then I would agree that you'll need to use what is either the spatial gain or horizontal gain, which basically means that what you'd be trying to do is increase the gain in the lower half of your image. The upper half of the image looks perfect. And actually, I'd be honest to say, I can see one, two, three, nearly four centimeters. I can see A-lines all the way to the bottom. So R1 is beautiful. R2, we are losing out on uh, a little bit in terms of the depth, but I would still say it looks like normal lung. So, you know, I completely agree with you. And just, th this is kind of con an X-ray that's not been done a while back. This is contemporaneous X-ray and lung ultrasound pretty much. They've been done at a similar time. Yes, yes, they are. They are. The uh, ultrasound, the chest X-ray was done the day before, and then the report sure. came uh, across. Sure, the, yeah. sure. I mean that looks normal. And again, I think you've highlighted a very powerful uh, kind of uh, way of being able to analyze the lung. And we use the chest X-ray while we're learning to kind of come back to that being our gold standard. But I mean, in terms of sensitivity and specificity, say for the diagnosis of mnemonic consolidation and atelectasis as I will, I will talk about today, uh, you'll find that the ultrasound can give you a lot more information. So thank you so much for sharing this case. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hassoun, uh, would you like to share? Okay, yes. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm sharing this my case because I was confused about the finding on X-ray. So this is was retrospectively. Um, this is 33 weeks, very low birth weight, IUGR, emergency C-section. Uh, this baby got respiratory distress, put it on CPAP, on, uh, and at 24 hours was on CPAP, very, clinically was very good on CPAP, well saturated, FI 2.21 even, so and so, no respiratory distress anymore. Uh, at 24 hours, we noticed this increased work of breathing, FI FIO2 goes up to 0.3, so we did at that time lung ultrasound, at chest exchange, the same time was done, well done. Uh, this is the finding of uh, ultrasound. I will go by R1. Uh, there is some B line, some comet line, good uh, plural sliding, and mainly a profile. I didn't see anything. So, and also I noticed uh, some baby we cannot get R1, R2, or L1, L2 very nice because of the heart. So I don't know if you if you have this uh, problem with not all baby, but some baby difficult to get this view on R1, R2, or L1, L2 with with this heart. Even so, the heart is not no problem, uh, no heart problem with the baby. Yeah. So uh, this is L2, or R2, sorry. Um, also, Plura is thin, good sliding, uh, some B lines, there is comet tail, and uh, I will label it as a profile. Yeah. Here, just, uh, I don't, it's just, uh, if the R2 uh, left to the image, I don't think we should consider this any, any subplural consolidation on the right side of the image, left side of the image, sorry. Here. No, I agree. I think that's just the alignment of your probe the rib is falling out and this often happens. So okay. it's just correcting the alignment of the probe. But I think if you correct it and you had a complete 90 degree alignment, then you'd see regular plura. My only comment in R1 is whether you have just a little bit of an effusion there or just- Here? No, 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 just at the top Here. where the thymus is. It's Here. difficult. I mean, my gut feeling is that's not because I think the plura ends. Yeah. So can yes. you see the rib? So that that is plura. And I, I just have a feeling that's thymus with the capsule. So that's not okay. on this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's Thank thymus you. in the top left hand with the two big cysts that you see. And okay. then you can see in R1, a very nice pleura. Uh, you can, it's sliding is definitely visible on your frame rate. And yeah, I can see an A profile with a kind of a B line to the right of the screen. So okay. you're having, and this is a very common theme. Uh, and it happens to all of us, and Naz was having the same problems. You're using, at the moment, you're losing out on depth. Uh, mm. You're losing the deep half of the lung. And that's probably because you need to change the frequency a bit, but also because your focus, uh, again, is probably at the level of the plura. I'd just say that your focus also 
is probably a little bit below the level of the pleura. So can you see okay. how beautifully you see the A-lines? And I mean, yes. it doesn't make a difference because we can make a good interpretation, but you probably just need your focus to go a little bit higher at the level of the pleura. And then if you want to see the deeper images, it's either dropping your frequency or maybe just reducing your depth a little bit. And so are you using, are you using a linear probe or a, a it's hockey linear stick? probe, a yeah. linear probe and the Siemens at 12 Hertz. Yeah. So this, yeah. this is what I, I, I did now. So I, I'm playing on the frequency also. I can decrease it to eight. Amazing. Up to 14. So yeah. this is what, yeah. So mm -hmm. this, the, I will go to R, R2, sorry, R3. Yeah. Also here, here I can see this good plural sliding or yep. deep profile and I can see double long point on this one. Completely agree. Okay. So, and uh, uh, R4, here complete B profile with some, uh, with common tail and sub, yeah, I see, yeah, on the right side of the screen, some sub plural consolidation, some plural So what's your baby's no? gestation? 33 weeks, IUGR. And did you give this baby surfactant? No, was not yet. Not yet, okay, not yet. that's fine. Not yet. How old is the baby? So, now 24 hours. So yeah. the first 20 hours was on CPAP, clinically improved, everything was okay. Just mm -hmm. after 24 hours, start to have increased work of breeze in the type of recession and tachypnea with FIO2 goes up also 2.3. Mm -hmm. That's why I did the ultrasound. Uh, okay, so on the left side, also L1, same uh, good plural sliding, and I can see a profile also with some beeline and comet tails. On L2, uh, same, yeah, nothing special. Hmm. If we go point, uh, to L3, L3, here we have, uh, I will say, complete B profile with good plural yep. sliding and some subplural consolidation. Uh, also the L, L4. So I consider this baby as having uh, maybe TTN. So uh, I just follow the baby, we didn't incubate. Uh, but uh, in the night, this baby got deteriorated. FIO2 go to 0.5. Yep. And uh, they did. This is a chest X-ray uh, when I did the first ultrasound. So it's looked like some background ground uh, glass appearance, but yep. almost yeah, any normal, nothing, nothing special. Here they did uh, an X-ray before intubation. It was for central line, and there is bilateral haziness. CRP. We got the CRP now. It was 28. So for them, it was considered as pneumonia, even so he's intubated and giving Cervanta because FIO2 went up, up above 50%. Yep. Uh, I didn't have the chance to, did, to do the ultrasound at that time. So I did it 12 hours after Cervanta, just to see what happened. If I can find some consolidation or some, something suggestive of pneumonia on the on ultrasound. Uh, L1, nothing special. Also some B-line, A profile, good plural sliding. Uh, R2 also, same. I didn't find any consolidation. So I don't know, Alok, if you find anything else. But my only comment when I look at your first set of images is that while a lot of the regions actually really look like you have uh, double lung points in some areas and a reasonably, I would say, decent plural line that looks regular, there are subplural consolidations. Yes. And, uh, you know, the real question that I'm asking is once you kind of say there's subplural consolidations, you tend to edge towards the diagnosis of RDS. But as Nadia has told us, you know, there's some babies who can kind of be in between. Now, was this uh, kind of a, did the mother have antenatal steroids mode of delivery? What was the mode of delivery? Yes. At, uh, uh, it was C-section, but uh, she got steroid, I think, at 28 or, so, or 29 weeks. And was she in established labor? Yeah. Okay, because my gut feeling is you probably have a little bit of an overlap of both conditions. Mm -hmm. And what I'd say is that the, the best way to evaluate these babies is serially. So really what you need is an ultrasound soon after birth. Now, if obviously at that particular stage, you don't have any subcrural consolidations, uh, you have kind of a white lung interstitial appearance, which then changes into an appearance with double lung points, the absence of consolidations. That would go more in favor of TTN. But once mm. you have subplural consolidations, really what that is pointing towards is an element of highline membrane disease or RDS. And it may okay. well be that you have an element of surfactant deficiency, which is giving you that clinical picture. 
but we okay. also know the crp is elevated and you know infection and a combination of that can then sometimes make the lungs deteriorate a little bit worse i can't see anything that would suggest to me mnemonic consolidation mm. uh, just if we just go back to your previous image yep so just this one here so if you just play them so for me what i'd say is that the images over here you know the subcortical consolidations look a little bit bigger than 5 mm some of them are comet tails but some of them look a little bit more dense and then if we go to the previous image here i i i can't see any subcortical consolidations i can only see comet tails so yeah. you have a little bit of a mix i think yeah. the beauty of it is you have to treat clinically and you can continue monitoring so yes i mean for me it's a tricky one i i would probably hinge my bet on this there being an element of surfactant deficiency here because you do have subcortical consolidations so uh, i was so confused because i did you know i was so reassured when i did the ultrasound so baby was looking fine my my ultrasound okay showing some uh, b profile but look like tt and so i was uh, so uh, happy and Uh, and I told them My not to activate. Gut feeling is that even if you thought of RDS and you did a lung ultrasound score on it, you would not have met the profile for surfactant at that stage. No. So I don't, I, so, yeah. I don't think it would have altered your management, and that's the beauty of it. That you know, this is where you remember yeah. I kind of said, don't get too fixated on trying to be absolutely accurate with, is this a hundred percent RDS versus is this a hundred percent TTN? Because we know that there's an element of overlap. and that's why following the clinical course of the baby with serial ultrasounds really helps i think for me what's beautiful is you've really identified the artifact well to be able to make your diagnosis now just in the middle there that image on the right side this is the one r3 r4 yeah so as uh, this is after cerventa 12 hours after cerventa yep yeah. so again you know you do have some subcortical consolidations that are visible there and yeah. in particular there's can you point it out image on the right This is no. the one. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, is that right? Yeah. Here you so, are. so just if you just move to the top, yeah. brutal yeah. line. Yep. Just move to your left. Can you see that dense area in between? You know, some this people one? might think that's a compact B line, but can you see how irregular uh, the pleura is with subcortical consolidation? Okay. So I just wonder whether that is a lung consolidation there. Ah. Uh, okay. It arises from the pleura. Yeah. The pleura is quite okay. irregular, and you've yeah. got subcortical consolidations. So. again you know there are elements here of an overlap of both because if you look at the image on the left that's a double lung point for you you know you've got and just the, just look this on the left side yeah. this one we can consider it as con yani as consolidation or just loss of contact no, of uh, so for my gut feeling is it's artifact because if you look at the pleura it's completely regular and it doesn't take its origin from the pleura so really what you should have is some element of pleural irregularity so if you look at the image on the right the one yeah. where we were previously that is that is a consolidation but oh, here okay. that deeper density that you see now yeah. there's something going on over there whether you've got a little bit of an air bronchogram coming in and out because there's an element of aeration uh, or whether that might represent a consolidation that you can't see because your alignment is at a different angle <clears throat> oh, okay so but okay. ideally by definition what we really need is some pleural abnormality for us oh. to by definition say it's a consolidation but i think oh. i think your images are very nice very good quality this is beautiful depth so can you see the 3 cm you gain settings here are perfect yeah, so yeah. i i'd say that these images are beautiful i wouldn't there's nothing that i could say to say you can get them just, better this is you know we cannot see anything also now the same issue on on uh, l1 l2 there is yeah. b line some sort of plural consolidation we, we don't have this deep consolidation or big consolidation and just this one i want to show you this one there are L3. Sure. Uh, I put Doppler on this part, this one to see if it is consolidation of not, but nothing, nothing no, obvious. No, it doesn't. And again, your pleural margin is just so regular. Uh, whether that's maybe it's it's a little bit tricky, but I would I wouldn't say that there's a consolidation there. Your pleural margin is just very regular. We're gonna have a look at a lot of consolidation at like this. But well done. Okay. So here, I think this is our. ال 3 and no no this is this is the one so this is the one uh, l l4 the last one sure okay so it was just i think my learning point from this one uh, to do serial serial ultrasound 
not just stick with one ultrasound, say, okay, everything is okay, and follow clinically, as you said there. So, well done. I think very nice images, uh, Dr. Hassoon, and Thank I think very, much. very good. So, now what we're going to do is we're going to break out into a workshop over the next 45 minutes. So, I am just going to try and share my screen. Just opening my PowerPoint as we speak. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can see it. And you can see it full screen? Yes. Okay, excellent. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a little bit of practice, and then we're going to talk a little bit about lung recruitment in neonates. And I, I think what I'd like to do is I'd like to highlight how it's done in the literature, also highlight to you that it's not something that I like doing. Uh, and uh, it's something that I'm very, very cautious about. Uh, I think what I'd say is that the practice has got to be done very, very carefully and uh, with constant supervision. But I'm just gonna take you back to the approach of where we kind of use lung ultrasound in acute situations. And in our last talk, what we kind of discussed was the importance of the approach to a baby who might be acutely desaturating. And when you're on the ventilator and you're desaturating on the ventilator, there's clearly a lot of conditions that can lead to acute desaturation. But a, a clinical assessment uh, of the background, uh, kind of uh, getting uh, an evaluation of making sure that if you ventilated, you've gone through the dope maneuver. And then kind of what we're thinking of is the investigations at hand. Uh, a few other things like kind of the clinical assessment, looking at, uh, looking for heart murmurs, looking to see whether there's more respiratory than cardiac, but pre and post ductal saturation. So kind of simple things that we must always do uh, before we actually think about getting an investigation done and having that approach and structure is quite crucial. Now, um, important aspect of kind of this approach is making sure that when you're having the approach, you're doing it in a structured way. And I've talked about what we call as the pit stop. So if you have a baby who's acutely desaturating, really what you've got to be thinking of is the investigation that you're doing, but also thinking on your toes about clinically what interventions you want to make do with, but more importantly, how you're going to organize your team to get those interventions on board. And a clear example is that you might be suspecting an omothorax on translimination using a lung ultrasound to confirm, but I think in the background, really what you should be doing is getting your team to prepare for potentially uh, a needle aspiration, if that's clinically indicated, or a chest pain, uh, just in case you might need to put that in. And that kind of background work should be happening in parallel, rather than kind of waiting for the lung ultrasound or chest x-ray and then deciding to start getting equipment ready. And a, a good example is, you know, some babies with a pneumothorax who are breathing might need an intubation kind of first to stabilize them. Uh, while you do a needle thoracentesis followed by a chest strain. And that's a huge amount of, I would say, organization uh, and human resource management that you need. But more importantly, what I'd say is based on your clinical diagnosis, think of your point of interest. Where and how are you going to do this lung ultrasound? Where are you going to start? And I think if you're thinking of a pneumothorax, uh, you want to go to the site uh, and side that you suspect clinically the pneumothorax will be. And you're really talking about the anterior and natural zones. Always be aware that if you don't have a pneumothorax, and in particular for older babies, we know that pneumonia can be a problem. And in particular, just the anterior and posterior zones in a baby who's been nurse supine, who's intubated and ventilated, and is developing a ventilator-required pneumonia could actually be in the posterior zones. So if you're not gonna do a comprehensive scan, there's a real risk that you might miss areas that then might alter your management. And I, I definitely say that for respiratory distress and congenital pneumonias, where you might have localization, uh, or alternatively, uh, I'd say episodes where a baby might have aspirated uh, milk, we know that the right main bronchus is a little bit more vertical. So again, it's really important that you're doing a comprehensive scan and a scan that's clinically indicated uh, when you're 
thinking of pneumonia uh, as a possibility. Again, if you're thinking of BPD and atelectasis, well, what is the position of your baby? Is this a baby who's been nurse prone, supine? Really, where are you likely to get atelectasis? And this is really crucial. For babies who we intubate and ventilate for long periods of time, who develop chronic lung disease, uh, a lot of babies uh, who have umbilical lines are never nursed uh, prone. And it's a classical bugbear of mine. Sorry, guys, I'm just going to interrupt the session just for a sec to take this call. Sorry, folks, am I visible and audible? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, my apologies. So just, again, covering the basics. Now, one of the things that's really important, like I said to you, is that for babies who are intubated and ventilated who start desaturating, we talked about some of the conditions and we, we did some cases last time that kind of covered pneumothorax, a little bit of kind of uh, lung edema and pneumonia, but really what is very important is that there might be areas or causes that include reversible atelectasis and a very important example. And this is very crucial if you're thinking of areas that you might want to recruit by improving ventilation is where your ED tube is. I cannot emphasize this enough. This is the one thing that is easily reversible that can be seen right at the start, even before you do your lung ultrasound. And you know, for a baby between one and three kilos, the kind of formula of weight plus six works really nicely. But just having a look to see where your tube is before you do the lung ultrasound. And in particular, if you have an evidence of what I'd say is a right upper lobe consolidation, atelectasis, and you can have both because atelectasis and consolidation often present together, mm -hmm. then putting the tube back can be the simplest thing that actually results in improvement because of reversible atelectasis collapse consolidation. Also remember, very crucially, and I'm, I'm taking you through this, it's a very important point, that sometimes what happens is you start doing your lung ultrasound on the left side. Now, if your tube is down the right main bronchus, it will give you a right-sided collapse consolidation. But just remember that it also includes the left bronchus. And sometimes you get a complete collapse of the left lung. So if you start on the left side and you see a consolidation with significant atelectasis, don't exclude the tube. Do a comprehensive lung ultrasound. 
So you must always do your R1, R2, R3, R4, L1, L2, L3, L4. And really that would, from your perspective, be good enough to be able to tell you uh, whether you've got atelectasis in the right upper lobe. Uh, and then if you find that that is completely normal, then you want to progress to your posterior regions depending on the baby's stability. But really that's where you're then looking at areas of atelectasis in the posterior lobes or in the right side or the left side of the lung, if your tube is in good position, that you might be able to recruit with ventilation. So with that in mind, let's have a look at a case. So uh, I've got a preterm baby who's 25 weeks, 770 grams, one of twins. Now this is a baby who's been ventilated for a few weeks. Let's say this is baby X. Uh, the baby delivered in a background of pre-prom since 15 weeks of gestation. So, you know, kind of a situation where there was a real worry that the baby actually might have significant lung hyperplasia, possibly amnionitis causing mnemonic kind of clinical presentation. But actually the baby came out in decent nick. Uh, the baby was breathing, it was vigorous. Uh, the baby was kind of uh, based on our protocol at the time, was intubated and given surfactant. We don't, we, we provide IPPV and PEEP, but most of these babies will get a tube and get surfactant and delivery suite because of the distances that we have to travel in, in my home institute. And uh, that basically means from our perspective that if the baby is completely stable and is kind of in air, we start with conventional ventilation uh, volume guarantee. And those are babies who we, we, we then look to extubate early. So as opposed to our Canadian colleagues who might want to kind of peep these babies around, we're a little bit more circumspect. Now, this is a baby who started with conventional ventilation, had a dose of surfactant uh, and was managed on VG, but clearly uh, at six mils per kilo was needing high pressures to achieve those volumes. So had another dose of surfactant. And we're now uh, at two weeks of age, kind of in a situation where the baby's never extubated. Uh, we uh, have evolving kind of chronic lung disease with the, the baby kind of not quite 30 days, but having a clinical picture on x-ray of what is bilateral kind of consolidation. And these are the settings for VG at six mils per kilo. So after that initial improvement with surfactant honeymooning, the baby kind of went on to need reasonable amount of pressures. So it was never extubatable uh, on a little bit of sedation, but at about 15 days of age, for six mils per kilo, we're needing pressures of about 30 now with a peep of 6.5. And uh, I, I've been called and I've been told that the baby has 100% oxygen and we have saturations of 80%. This is a gas that's just been done with a pH of 7.2 and a CO2 of 64. So we've done the due needful of doing dope, going through the basics, examining the child kind of Considering things clinically, the baby is already on antibiotics uh, because of uh, having had some temperature instability earlier uh, the day before. And uh, the CRP actually was just six. So let's have a look at lung ultrasounds. Anybody want to volunteer? Anybody want to have a go? It's me, if you want. Is that Dr. Hassoon? Dr. Hassoon, yes. would you like a partner in crime? Anybody want to help Dr. Hassoon? I, I can help you. Okay, Dr. Zaruddin. Okay, that's great. So we've talked about the kind of settings. Now, this is R1 for you. So. But uh, this baby, uh, we, we are sure that dope is okay. Sorry, the dope is perfect. So no pneumothorax. The tube basically is at the right level at the lips. Uh, we have had a, a good color change on a pericap. We've got loops coming in and out. The equipment's definitely working, good chest wall movement. And uh, from our perspective, you know, uh, we've kind of, the nurses are quite confident, no secretions. And this okay. is what you see on R1, yeah. So th this is a, uh, a regular pleura um, with sub pleural consolidation, yeah. uh, complete B profile. Okay, I uh, agree. So kind of, I'd say you're right, a white lung kind of an appearance, maybe compact D lines merging together to give you that. Uh, the pleura is very irregular. Is there any shred sign? Yes. Okay, anybody else think? What do you think, Dr. Zaradin? Shred sign? I, I can't see the shred sign as a convincing one, to be honest, uh, but the consolidation uh, just beneath the pleura is very evident. 
uh, maybe to confirm to do a Doppler. Yep, beautiful. So we will have a look at that. Uh, so, sorry, uh, yep. look, is these uh, uh, snowflake signs? Are there snowflake signs? So, if 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 this baby were a day or two old, I would consider it. But we're kind of okay. over two weeks old, so we don't really use it in that context. Okay. But I mean, if you were to say evolving lung disease in a baby, say for example, where the pleura is irregular, there's definite. So if I if I if I just go in order. Uh, I've basically got uh, the batwing sign with the ribs. I then have pleura in between that's very irregular. It doesn't have a regular margin with a lot of subpleural consolidation that you can see. Uh, it's very dense towards this part of the screen. So I'm just going to show you with the laser pointer here. Can you see that? Yes. So whether you have a slightly deeper consolidation there, but I would agree with uh, Dr. Hassoun, that he's absolutely right. This is a B profile with plural sliding and, uh, you know, really a very regular plural with sub plural consolidations and maybe a slightly deeper consolidation in R1. So, I mean, just forming a mental model at the moment. Uh, at the moment, we're just showing you R1 again, and then I'm showing you R2. So have a look at R2. Um, R2, I think the same is, we have also this irregular pleura with uh, some uh, subpleural consolidation yeah. and uh, compact B line. But I don't think this is maybe some shred sign uh, on the left side of the image. I, I'm not sure. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So again, we're going to see a lot of shred sign because I know that it creates a lot of confusion. So this, I want to clarify to everybody, is just drop out from the ribs. Okay, yes. this is not a shred sign. These are subplural consolidations that you can see over here. And shred sign should be very irregular. It should be deep and very irregular. And I'm not really convinced this is very irregular at this particular point. I, I just think you have subplural consolidation with a very irregular pleura. But uh, I mean, in terms of kind of obvious consolidation and atelectasis, can you see any obvious consolidation or atelectasis in R2? No, no. no. Okay. Uh, Dr. Zaridin, do you concur? Um, actually, I have a point, uh, kind of a burning question about. Please, if, if if we if we are going to accept that this is a just for the sake of the discussion that this is a shred sign, can shred sign be that widespread in every single um, part of the pleura? Because my ah. my my understanding is that it's a big sign that is localized to an area of. Uh, kind of a pneumonia or consolidation rather than being seen uh, regularly and nicely on every single part of the lung. So if you have a particular area of the lung affected, like a lobe or a focal kind of mnemonic consolidation, then absolutely it can be localized. But if you have a bronchopneumonia, very severe mnemonic kind of presentation, and I will show you a case next time, where you can see a shred sign virtually throughout the whole of the lung lobe. But for me, what I'd say is these are subclural consolidations. They're just not irregular enough. Uh, and you do not have that hyperdensity that you normally have. So yes. as we go forwards and I show you some more images, you'll get a much better feel. But I think mental model wise, I think we'd all agree. So, and this is where I want to differentiate what is subclural consolidation and what are proper deep consolidation. So subplural consolidations, as we see in RDS or like the snowflake sign at the start, are basically below the level of the pleura. They, they're small. Uh, if you see a large hypoechoic area below the level of that, then that's usually subplural atelectasis. Here you can't see any subplural atelectasis. There's no hypoechoic area in this margin. But really what you can see is these densities, which basically are subplural consolidations. The question from my perspective is just this area here, whether you might, it stretches quite deep and whether you have a slightly deeper consolidation here. Now, again, just remember for deeper consolidation, I'm clarifying again, you must have an irregularity that stems from the plural margin. So if you saw something over here that looked like a consolidation, but your plural was completely regular, then by definition, that's not a consolidation. And the most common reason for having those kind of artifacts on the left side are is the heart coming in, is there an element of diaphragm lower down or sometimes you may get confused with kind of dynamic air bronchograms moving in and out. So what I'd say is that 
here, this is the only area that makes me a little bit more suspicious that you might have a deeper consolidation, but the rest of the lung looks pretty white. And I'd say that R1, R2, and take my word for it, R3, R4. So this is R3. So it looks exactly the same. Are you happy with that? Yes, but just the, I look in, I yeah. think in the middle, it is, uh, this one is it, yes. It says, uh, this is also for sure sub plural, but I don't think there is shred sign here, no? I would agree it's no shred sign. It's not as hypoechoic. This is a deep consolidation. These are superficial consolidations that you see over here, sub plurally. And really from our perspective, we're kind of in the situation where, uh, I know that people get confused with this, but this is not a shred sign, no. It, it, a fractal sign should be deep, with a very regular margin and we'll see some today so don't worry okay. Okay. but i mean if you were just considering r1 r2 r3 and this is r4 again again same yep yeah. so what what kind of differentials come to your mind so you've got a baby who's acutely desaturating is this a pneumothorax is there evidence of a pneumothoraxia no okay no no plural effusion and uh, yeah, uh, one of them is uh, pneumonia or yep. uh, evolving uh, evolving uh, chronic lung disease. Now we are two weeks of age. Sure. Okay. Uh, Dr. Zaridin, do you concur or any thoughts? Oh, I agree. I agree. Okay. So just now, just a few messages. Your baby is supine. And really, because the baby was in 100%, the baby had been paralyzed. Okay. So what, what what do you want to do next? We'll do left side to see what happens. Okay. Uh, do you want to see R5, R6? If possible, yes, for sure. Yeah. So how are you going to see R5 and R6 without moving the baby? Uh, we can we can go some yeah, posteriorly on, on uh, when the baby is supine, but go a little bit posteriorly to see it. Okay. So what you can do in this situation is you want to keep the baby completely stable is you go to the posterior axillary line and direct your probe towards the back. Alternatively, you can get the nurses to move the baby uh, a little bit to kind of be able to access R5 and R6. And that's exactly what we did in this situation. Just going to take my, my cursor off. Okay, so now what do you see over here? Oh, okay. Here, here the plura is very irregular. And here I think there is complete shred sign in the obvious one. Okay. And with B profile, so with deep consolidation also. Okay, so uh, I, what do you think, Dr. Zaridin? Yes, especially in the one, two, three, the third in the coastal space, there is a clear deeper consolidation. Yep. Very disrupted plural line. Um, I can't really see much of the plural sliding at all because it's broken down. And yep. uh, deeper, deeper, there's uh, lots of fluids, I guess. So you can see a plural line here that is very irregular. You can yep. see some deep, some consolidations there, subplural consolidations. Those might be static bronchograms. Can you see those? Yeah. Uh, again, now, as you come here, can you see any plura? No. Okay. No. And can you see how hypoechoic hypo this margin looks? And yeah, I would yeah. agree it's very irregular. And, you know, the key question from our perspective is, is this a shred sign? Is this a, a fractal sign? Or is this subplural consolidation? Uh, or is this kind of... Uh, absolutely. Is this subplural okay. atelectasis? Plural and plural. this is... I would say the most difficult thing to answer in lung ultrasound in that it is, it, it, this is a very big challenge. Now, what did we say when we say atelectasis, what did we say are the features of atelectasis? You can have dynamic bronchogram. Uh, oh, sorry, static. static yeah. So you'll have static bronchograms. What did we say about plural margin? What happens? It disappears? Disappear in, yeah. in atelectasis, no plural margin should be seen. Yeah, complete atelectasis, no plural margin should be seen. So if you have a, a complete atelectasis, often with the subplural areas that kind of fall down. So can you see how hyper the margin looks? And then you've got these static air bronchograms yeah. that you see these bright points, but then you have got these deep consolidations where the plural is irregular. So really, this could be one of three things. This could be a mnemonic kind of a consolidation with a little bit of atelectasis. 
Uh, this could be chronic lung disease with a little bit of atelectasis. So, and you've got a complete white out lung. But what does this tell you about the back of the lungs? It's more severely affected, I think. Yeah. A, yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's have a look at R6. We can do, I think, though, look, we can, uh, doctor, it help in this case. Yeah, it will. And we'll, we'll have a look at how. But let's, let's look at R6 first. So what do we think over here? Here we have uh, for sure irregular uh, pleura, uh, subpleural consolidation. There is, I think, the dy dynamic or no, no, this is a static bronchogram. I, I don't see any dynamic bronchogram and deep consolidation also. But this is a shred or atelecta. This I see the pleural line is seen in some area, but in other area, no. So I cannot, I cannot say this is a clear atelecta. Or, so it may be component of consolidation and atelecta. Okay. So, and this is exactly what I want to highlight to you, how confusing this picture could be, because this is very suspicious for a, for a shred sign, this area. Can you see my marker? Yeah, yeah. But then you've got this kind of margin here of what looks like lung, and it's very hypoechoic. And what do you think this is? Could be pleural effusion, this yeah, one? Yeah, absolutely. So this could be a pleural effusion. And you basically have what is what looks like a compressive atelectasis here. Uh, it's very hypoechoic with, I would say, static bronchograms. I can't see any dynamic bronchograms. And that is the only point that goes against an ammonia in this, mm. is that you're kind of in the situation where if this was mnemonic, we'd see some dynamic bronchograms. I mean, for me, again, what you've got is, has the pleura fallen back here? And is this atelectasis or is this an ammonia? And it's really confusing. So what you can do is you can put Doppler on it to try and help you. But is there anything else you can do? Something that we were going to talk about today. Transparency. Sorry? Improved PIP to see if it's a disease. Beautiful. So somebody said transverse view. So we're already doing a transverse view, but you could do a longitudinal view of each rib space, and that might give you more information. You might be able to see uh, the shred sign better. So I, I completely agree. But uh, yeah, uh, somebody, Anna, I think said that you increase the peep or you increase the pressure. Now, the question from your perspective is if this resolves and this margin comes back to the end of the lung, then from your perspective, actually, this was atelectasis. Yes. Uh, but if it doesn't improve, and this is where you have to be very careful. So the question is, how much pressure are you going to use to actually do that? And this is something that is very poorly defined in the literature. And that is where the danger arises. Because when you read the literature about how it's done, they talk about increments of PEEP by one to two, uh, with theoretically from our perspective, uh, this done over a period of minutes. Now, I, I would argue to you that if you're already on a PEEP of eight or nine, in a baby with chronic kind of lung disease, and you decide that you want to go to 9, 10, 11, or 12, then really you might end up with a pneumothorax. And I think that's where you have to individualize each case. Uh, for me, this looks more like atelectasis. And I know you can see a little bit of pleural margin there, but that's because you probably have a syndemonic effusion or a, a kind of an effusion there. And again, what I'd say is this atelectasis with pleura coming back from the margin is my feeling. Putting Doppler on this particular area showed no blood vessels at all. I haven't been able to download that image because I was looking for it. But actually when I put Doppler on this particular area, there was nothing that suggests focal blood supply issues uh, or kind of increased hyperemia in these regions, which is why I kind of thought, well, look, probably. And then when you look at it more closely, so this is just another image. And you see how, how, how sickle shaped yes. it looks. Yeah. Again, static air bronchograms, it's very hypoechoic. And Actually, this area in particular, this is classical atelectasis for you because of fluid. Here, you've got subpleural consolidations, very irregular pleura. Now, the question is, this is compressive atelectasis due to fluid. And this is another point that I want to make, that actually, if you have compressive atelectasis secondary to fluid, then do you think recruitment will make a difference? No. It might do, but it might not. And really for compressive atelectasis with a massive pleural effusion and atelectasis, really it's drainage of the fluid that becomes important as opposed in addition to any ventilation changes that you want to make. So 
I'd just be a little bit cautious. You need to think of why that atelectasis is taking place. Uh, excuse me, Alok. Yes, was, please. On, on R5, was there a, an element of effusion on the top left side of the screen? On yeah, R5? Here. No, R5. On back, uh, the, I think the previous, and again the previous one. Uh, yeah, here. On the top left hand yeah, side. I would agree. Small rim there. Okay. So I would agree. Yep. But more obvious over here, especially as you come to the basal regions of the lung. So just remember, we're most dependent over here. Hence, you know, the, the larger pocket of fluid that's easily visible. Now, let's see what the left looks like. What do we think? How are we going to define this? Well, the polar margin is not seen at all in here. Yep. And uh, we have this static also brancogram, brancogram deep consolidation. So it looked like also at the left of this issue. And I didn't see, I don't see any plural effusion on this, uh, on this yep. Uh, image. Yep. So again, putting Doppler over here didn't give me any particular kind of blood vessel changes. But you see this large hypoequic area with static air bronchograms. So really what you're seeing is aeration probably coming up to this margin over here, but no aeration because there's no distal pleura. So these yeah. are the ribs. And really the confusion that you'd have is I can't actually see a proper batwing sign, but that's because the, the whole of the lung on this side in L5 is atelectatic. And this is L5, L6. And can you see the same pattern that you saw in R5, R6? See that? This is complete lung atelectasis. Okay. Can you see the sickle shape zone? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. This is complete atelectasis. I'm not convinced this fluid over here. Can anybody tell me anything else? There's some very nice signs here, over here. Here's a bronchogram. Is it static or dynamic? Uh, what do we think? So let's throw it out to the audience, guys. What do we think? Static or dynamic? Some, uh, for me, some of them are dynamic. My, my, yeah, maybe just one over here that I can yeah. see. Yeah. But overall, I'd say this is static, the majority. And there might be some air trap. So again, bigger picture. I don't have obvious dynamic air bronchograms. I have more static air bronchograms. And this basically, this margin here looks like a large area of atelectasis because the pleural margin is completely gone. I can't see pleura at all. I can just start seeing some pleura over here. Yeah. Maybe a little bit here, but it's completely gone over here. So again, putting a, a Doppler here would be really helpful. I haven't done it in this particular case, but these are regions of lung that you might be able to recruit. So remember your baby's supine with bad chronic lung disease and is desaturating. And really the question is, it's often the posterior zones of the lung that are really poorly recruited. And that is one of the reasons why proning in these babies really helps. Yeah. So, you know, it's really, really important. So, okay. So this is the same baby at a much later time on the right lung. I'm just giving you an example. The baby is actually much further down the line. So what do we think about this image? Also, also his pleura is very irregular. Yeah. Deep consolidation. And this uh, I don't I don't see the plural margin here also. Yeah. So you have no plural margin here. Uh, now this gets really confusing because this could be a shred sign. But I have no plural margin here. And can you see when yeah. I put Doppler? Do I have any blood vessels? Yes, there is any? some blood vessels. So is it is, is there a typical kind of flow or is it just a diffuse kind of a speckly pattern? No, it's diffuser. Yeah. So this is where I would say that be very careful. When you put Doppler on, really what you should be able to see is a blood vessel-like arrangement. This is just Doppler. And really it's a speckle pattern without any particular blood vessel kind of pattern. Again, this is atelectatic lung. It's, it's yes. completely atelectatic lung. You've got a complete white lung appearance. Plura has basically... Uh, kind of degraded itself from the margin. And this hypoequic area is an area of atelectasis. And this is really in a region that I would like to recruit. Now, if you see this in uh, uh, the right upper lobe, again, just go back and just have a look to see where your tube is. Now, let's see what pneumonia looks like.
How do I get rid of this? Okay, so it's showing you atelectasis again. And now let's have a look at pneumonia. So can you see the blood vessels there? Oh, yes, yes. Can you see the blood vessels there? Again, yeah. a very regular margin that you see. And this is why I'm showing it to you because it can be very confusing. And this, from my perspective, is a shred sign. Can you see how irregular and sharp the borders are? Okay. But it, I'm just highlighting to you how confusing it can be. This is mnemonic consolidation. You have to clinically correlate as well. I mean, I have a high CRP in this, this other baby that I'm showing you. So can you see how the blood vessel arrangement is within that area? It's very focal, as opposed to being just diffuse and speckled. So if I just show you this, you've got a speckle kind of appearance, but here it's much more focus. What about here? What do we think, guys? Yeah, there is just diffuse uh, Doppler, and it's not uh, with vessel. Yeah, we, we are not seeing a vessel. So, what do we uh, think? But the plural, plural margin is okay, is seen. This high yeah. density. Uh, so, what do we think that is? Atelectasis. Yeah, yeah, that's atelectasis for you. So, what I'm trying to highlight to you is it can be very difficult. I, I, I even for the best of people, whether that's the experts, uh, I'm sure it's as difficult for, you know, Nadia and Almedina. But, you know, this area where you expect blood vessels, if this was a shred sign, I, I can't really see a blood vessel pattern. I just see a speckled appearance. There are some very dense areas over here. But again, this is outside the level of the lung. We're talking about the ribs over here. So this is the importance of using Doppler accurately. And this is pneumonia for you. So can you see how focus this particular area looks with the blood vessels and spend some time spend some time there keep your doppler there try try to mental model and if you're confused just go back to what we said get a second person a fresh pair of eyes to come and have a look at it but these are just some of the features that help you differentiate uh, focal atelectasis diffuse atelectasis consolidation from pneumonia i think a key important aspect of differentiating kind of Consolidation and atelectasis and, or mnemonic consolidation is, consolidations like in meconium or in pneumonia will often be bilateral patchy. Uh, pneumonia per se can have dynamic kind of air bronchograms, but atelectasis or collapse will usually have static air bronchograms. Sorry guys, just to...
so can I, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, excellent. So just moving on to our kind of talk today, which is not going to be a very long talk, but what I want to highlight is how lung recruitment has evolved and how it's done. And really from our perspective, what we will do in subsequent kind of sessions is basically demonstrate to you in real time how it's done. But more importantly, it, it, a lot of it evolved from adult critical care, where in particular during, and especially during the COVID period, where people had COVID pneumonia, people used ultrasound to basically detect recruitment of lung areas. And classically, those lung areas, which are kind of gravity dependent and tend to collapse, uh, can be recruited in real time by actually putting an ultrasound probe to actually review that while you're actually increasing lung pressure. But what we always must realize is that not all types of kind of visible lung ultrasound appearances are amenable to recruitment. And a good example is you might have a mnemonic kind of a consolidation with exudate that's resulted in kind of bronchial blockage. Now, increasing your ventilation might shift that exudate and may recruit lung. But if you have complete, say, consolidation with a completely obstructed bronchus with a mnemonic kind of a consolidation, actually that might not be recruitable. And the risk is that if you try to increase your pressure too much, then actually you might not just only cause pneumothorax, but you also alter heart-lung dynamics. And in extremely preterm and small preterm babies, as Nadia has pointed out, small changes in PEEP can reduce your venous return. And before you know it, you don't have enough flow to the pulmonary kind of uh, uh, the lungs. And as a result of that, you kind of create problems with hypoxemia secondary to reduce venous return, which actually makes things worse. So be very, very careful. Uh, what we know is that there's certain patterns that have been described in the literature, some of which I will introduce you to today, which help us differentiate between patterns which are amenable to recruitment, so specifically lung collapse, versus patterns that are not kind of amenable to recruitment. And a good example is if you just have interstitial edema, Increasing PEEP might actually reduce that, uh, especially if you have heart failure. So you might find that you go from what is a complete whiteout or a, a B lung profile to well aerated A lung profiles. And that's an example of lung recruitment in that context. On the other hand, you might have atelectasis, which needs high pressure, which then presents with what is what we call a C profile, if you remember your, your kind of classification. Uh, the C profile then converts into and gradually recruits, as you can see over here. So as pressure is going up, this kind of area of atelectasis is gradually recruiting to the point where you get what is still a white lung appearance because you have severe chronic lung disease, but actually better recruited lung, which is more likely to be aeratable because of good ventilation dynamics. So again, having a particular profile in itself to identify atelectatic lung is one aspect but you can have different profiles like a B or a C profile, and they can actually proceed towards lung aeration depending on the underlying pathology you have and what kind of ventilation changes you're making. Again, I'm just giving you the analogy of heart failure. So often babies with a large duct might have lungs that are completely flooded or an AVST baby who's on say air. Now, if that baby is put on PEEP and from our perspective uh, is in a situation where we have uh, kind of prevention of the left to right shunt, you might find that basically an AIS or a B profile pattern then goes to uh, what is maybe compact B lines, gradual further recruitment results in better aeration to a kind of an AB profile. And that's kind of recruitment from a perspective of say a B profile. But for atelectasis or consolidation, it's really trying to see where that plural margin is moving to and how it's opposing up. And this, this really means trying to achieve what we call is a critical opening pressure. Now, how do we do that? So how has it been described in the literature? And it's very much applicable to how it's done uh, in adults and in neonates. And the most important thing is you first confirm your pattern. So is this lung atelectasis or collapse? Or is it mnemonic consolidation with lung atelectasis or collapse? Or is this just a complete whiteout? And now chronic lung disease with well-recruited lungs can present with a B profile and whiteout. Now, if you're well-recruited in that situation with no focal areas of atelectasis to recruit, and you just keep on increasing the pressure in that situation, what will happen is you will, you will cause problems. And in particular, you may impact heart-lung interaction. And the first thing, once you confirm that you feel an area of the lung needs to be recruited is 
how stable this baby is for a recruitment maneuver. Now, I'm going to give you a simple example. You, an extremely preterm baby, like the one we've just seen, who I've just presented, has that kind of appearance in the back of its lungs. Now, I can oscillate this baby. I can increase the peep from where it already is. But where am I? Where is my resting state? Well, I've got a peep of 6.5 already in that case, if we go back to it. So I have scope to go up on the peep before I oscillate. Now, the reason I'm kind of thinking of that is because if I look at the blood pressure on this baby and it's already low, because this baby is in a situation where the baby is septic or has other problems with it, then actually going onto the oscillator and using a very high map very quickly will actually reduce venous return. And that reduction in venous return means less pulmonary blood flow, less oxygenation, and paradoxically, I'll make things worse. So you must clinically assess your baby. You must look at their, their state. And a good example from my perspective before I do this is looking at the filling of the heart. I like to look at the IVC distensibility if you're not oscillated. If you're oscillated, the IVC will be stented wide open. But I'd also like to look at the filling of the heart. Eyeballing is good. You know, what does the right atrium and the right ventricle look like? Is it reasonably well filled? You know, is this a baby who's going to tolerate a recruitment maneuver at this particular point of time? So you make those assessments, you look at pulses, you look at blood pressure. Now, if I have a low blood pressure with a heart that's kind of collapsed, I might actually, while I'm preparing to do the recruitment maneuver, want to give this baby some volume, improve preload, try to fill that right side of the heart. Alternatively, I might, from my perspective, want to avoid oscillating with a very high map and just go up and short increments of PEEP. So the second step of will the baby or the patient tolerate the lung recruitment maneuver with heart-lung interaction. Now, for those of you who don't do echo, that might be as simple as celebrating, examining the baby, looking at pulses, having a feel of where your liver is, kind of looking at the baby clinically, looking at blood pressures and having an overall assessment. And if you have uh, an invasive arterial blood pressure, that's ideal. But if you have non-invasive trends that are kind of dropping, your pulses are clinically weak and you have a lactate that's elevated. Well, this lung recruitment maneuver might not be well tolerated without some volume. Alternatively, if you're on some inotrope and you're struggling with a low blood pressure, you might want to give some volume and you might want to increase your inotrope depending on what's your choice and what you use. I'm not going to go into those details. So optimizing the patient for this is, is really important. But how do we start a lung recruitment maneuver? So what's been described in uh, the literature very classically is that you look at your zones of atelectasis. And if I take you back to our scans, and this is very important. So really, these are my zones of atelectasis, L5, L6. And if I look at the previous scan, actually R5 and R6. Now, I'm just going to ask you all a question. Where, where would you, if you wanted to recruit these lungs, where would you start? Would you start anteriorly? Anybody want to start anteriorly? Go for it, guys. No, I think we should. Yeah, you should go posterior first. Okay. So posterior is very large. So we've got R five. We've got R six. We've got. L5, we've got L6. So where would you like to start? We'll go with lung basis. Very good. So let's say we've kind of made our minds up that usually the fives and sixes, dependent area of the lung, but you've got the right and the left, which is worse? Left. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Zaridin, you're saying something? Yeah, left left side. Yeah, left side is worse. So my experience usually says I will start with the, the worst side. And for me, if I look at L5 and if I look at L6 at this particular point, so they're, they're really bad. So I am going to start, in, this is the L6 region, because actually you can see screen with diaphragm there. And really from my perspective, I'm, I'm going to put my probe dependently in this particular position and what I'm going to do is go up in increments of PEEP by one. I don't do twos. I do ones in these situations. Now, the, what's classically described in the literature is that you do it every one or two minutes. And really, once you're doing it, you keep your probe and you really look for re-aeration of the lung. And if you have a C profile, what you're really looking to see is, does that C profile convert into tissue sign 
with the pleura coming up, which indicates aeration. So if I was to able to kind of recruit this area of the lung, then really what I'd be seeing is this margin. So I'm just going to focus on it so that you can see. Is this margin coming up with the pleura starting to become visible? And it may be that I can't recruit all the way up to the pleura, but I might be able to half it. So if this kind of appearance, the L5, after say an increase in peep by two or three, went and looked like this, then I know that my recruitment maneuver has worked. And really that is what you're trying to look at, but you have to do it very carefully. And really whilst you're doing it, what is very, very important from your perspective is that you keep a very close eye on the plural. And this is a very good example of what you can see is plural recruitment by increasing peep in increments of one. So just keeping uh, the kind of probe in one particular area, but you can see the plural rise up. And eventually, can you see how the plural, the margin gets visible? And you have virtually the entire plural margin visible here. And the reason the plural margin is visible, despite you having a, a dominant white lung profile, is because you're still having an element of aeration there. For pleura to be visible, you have to have aeration to that distal region. So that is how you do lung recruitment. It's been described very well in case series only. And this is very important. This is why I'm trying to highlight the strong, high quality evidence of demonstrating that lung ultrasound guided pulmonary recruitment works in every baby does not exist. And there are real risks if you use it in the context of a baby who might not have recruitable lung, and that is not easable, easy to tease out. So I would, I would strongly advise that when you're doing it, if you're doing it, you do it in very controlled circumstances with patient optimization. And usually when I'm doing this, it might mean volume. It might mean making sure you have a good blood pressure and I'm not aggressive. And I know that, you know, uh, having spoken to other colleagues who actually use it, some people are very aggressive. <laughs> they some five to six, I've seen. Uh, math work from 11 to 17 years. I would be very careful of how you're going to affect the lung venous return to the lung. Uh, from the heart because of reducing it, but also the risk of a pneumothorax. If you start trying to do that in a baby with who's just received surfactant on day one or day two, you're really talking trouble. Now, what I'm going to talk to you about is how I do it. And this is just something that I call the DPSS approach. So first of all, I'm going to look at areas that I would define, I think are atelectetic. And we know that consolidation can exist with atelectasis. And I will try and define the area that I think is most atelectetic, and that would be my area. And that, that is comes back to the principle that I'm telling you is the point of interest. You place the probe in the most dependent area in relation to that area of atelectasis or consolidation. And as I said, for me, it's a slow process. I do increments of one, and I usually do them every two, maybe even three minutes. Now, a good example is if I'm not saturating and where it's permissible. Some people like to go into 100%, get the baby saturating. And as your atelectasis goes up and your saturations improve, you can either wean FiO2 or as your saturations pick up, you might find that actually with the lung recruiting, you can wean the FiO2 from where it actually was. It depends on what your baseline state was. Now, if I have a baby with sats of 60, uh, really I've incremented oxygen, I've hit 100% then really what I'd be looking at is an improvement in SATs, but I'd be weaning FiO2 simultaneously as I recruit lung. The most important thing from my perspective is once you start, when do you stop? So I'm just going to put it out to the group. Any criteria for neonates where you would stop? So you're increasing PEEF. You can see that lung is progressing through patterns as described like this. But when do you stop? How much PEEF are you going to go up by before you achieve what you think is your clinical endpoint? So let's let's just have a group discussion, guys. What do we think? I think obviously ox oxygen saturation is one of the important um, indicators of success. In addition to the direct imaging, while the increments is going on. Okay. Anything else? You're right. You're absolutely right. Um, driving pressure, like you know, the mean pressure. If that's Becoming, if improved, that give me an idea. 
Uh, yep. Yeah, so what you're kind of saying, Dr. Leila, is that as you increase pressure, you see the recruitment. My, my question is, well, how much do you recruit? How much is too much? How, because there's a risk you're going to affect venous return to the heart. And how are you going to make that assessment? I mean, they're changing the patterns of the lungs. I mean, that's what I'm looking for. It just, I, I, I don't understand. Uh, look, uh, you yeah. said you focus in the worst area, but yeah. we know there's area of the lungs which are not as bad. And these are the areas I would worry about, right? That, that very good, good, very good. Yeah. So you've hit a very important point that we're, we're focusing on the worst area, but without realization that they're good areas of the lung that we're over distending as well. And this is the point I'm trying to make that, because we don't know what we might be doing to them, we have to be very, very careful. And a good example from my perspective is that I'd say that normally if you look at an oscillator and you oscillate, you'd normally go, go too above to kind of recruit lung. Uh, you'd, you'd basically, uh, lung recruitment strategies as described in the literature based on FiO2 would, would follow a similar kind of a pattern. But mm -hmm. certain, certain red flags for me are Say, for example, if I've gone up by a peep of three and my FiO2 is not improving and I'm not able to recruit this area, then really I am asking myself a question, is this really atelectasis? Is this recruitable lung? Or am I dealing with consolidation, mnemonic consolidation that I'm not going to be able to recruit? And a, a good other example is arterial blood pressure. If you have invasive arterial monitoring and you find that your blood pressure is starting to drop, but also looking at your heart and filling, and if you find that the right side of the heart is really starting to struggle, your, your right atrium is starting to collapse, then these are all signs that you use in conjunction. And this is why I would say to you that in a novice hand, this can be very dangerous and it can, it can be counterproductive. Uh, I have seen pneumothoraces happen. Uh, I have seen situations where, you know, venous return decreases to the point where blood pressure is not good, your lactates are starting to go up. And that's why I would say to you is, what I am telling you today is very theoretical really your ability to be able to perform lung recruitment involves a lot of heart lung interaction. And that's why I'm doing this after Nadia's talk. And I think as part of this, I would be really keen that we learn how to do heart lung interaction, that we learn how to assess that. For those people who can't do it using point of care ultrasound, your hemodynamic assessment, invasive arterial blood pressure, what's happening to it uh, are absolutely crucial. And I'd say that if you're not having an improvement in saturations, your FiO2 is not uh, coming down, then be wary of being too gung-ho because actually what you might end up with is a lot of damage to an area of the lung that doesn't need recruitment. So we have a few questions. Uh, Mayanka, I saw your hand up first. Go for it. Uh, I didn't have a question. Actually, I wanted to answer the same. Please. So please. yeah, yeah, I would also have uh, seen the uh, uh, response to uh, FiO2 going up or down and looking at the uh, blood pressures as well as the signs of perfusion. And uh, in our unit, we typically do not go beyond 15 in pre-terms and 17 in uh, terms. So uh, definitely- 15 if, uh, peep. 15, 15 yeah, peep. Map. 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 Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You would not go beyond 15. Yeah. So uh, definitely uh, with clinical uh, uh, condition would uh, predominate over the uh, fixed number. So if the baby is become unstable or the perfusion is not okay and the uh, uh, saturation is not improving, we would not uh, uh, increase the PIP map. Okay, that's really helpful. I'm keen to hear other opinions. I mean, we have a lot of experience in this group, over a hundred years. So a anybody else want to come in? Naz, you have your hand up. I um, just wanted to ask, um, going up by one beat um, at a time makes sense, but then how long do you wait before you go up again? Yeah, uh, clinical experience. So what I'd say is, what is the background and where, what beep did you start with? And if, and we, I'm, I mean, I'm giving you ventilated babies here. You can do this on non-invasive ventilation. Now on non-invasive ventilation, using peeps of up to, eight to 10 from my perspective or something that I do. Uh, I'm going to be very honest. I'm not as brave as my Canadian colleagues to kind of hit peeps of 12 and more. I, I feel, I think you need to kind of think of something else. Uh, maybe that's a lack of experience. I'm going to be humble enough to acknowledge that. And I, I'd be happy for you know others to share their experience. But on non-invasive ventilation, you have scope because actually you're going to be less damaging. But I think if you're kind of in a situation where you have a baby who say, 
has mnemonic consolidation with atelectasis, is an extremely preterm baby who's seven or eight days old, whose lungs are still really fragile. Really, the real risk is you might end up with an omothorax. Again, what I'd say is lung recruitment strategies in the context of just having given a baby surfactant. You have babies with meconium aspiration, who often, these are babies who I have seen benefit from lung recruitment maneuvers, where there is, there is commonly consolidation atelectasis, which coexist. And really, those are babies who are big in term. And often what you find is we're ventilating on pressures of 28 over 5, 5.5, and actually increasing a peep from 5 to 7, maybe 8, to achieve a recruitment maneuver is something that you can do in a controlled manner, maybe over a period of, say, my bravery would be about maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes. But really, if I'm not getting improvement, I'm going to within my limitations, basically go back to what I think is physiological, or if I find falls in blood pressure, and I would not hesitate to go back to a chest x-ray if I'm, I'm struggling, I want to see nine posterior ribs. And again, my argument would be my level of experience with lung ultrasound is just not as good as Nadia's and Almedia's. I was speaking to Nadia yesterday and I was kind of asking her, well, what do you guys do? They don't do, because they don't do x-rays. And she, she, she feels very confident of, you know, being quite aggressive, going up by up to five, you know, one, so a peep of four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, very quickly to try and achieve this kind of appearance of the lung, uh, as you can see over here, to kind of get to the margin and look at clinical improvement and then correlate. But say, for example, if you're not getting any improvement with that, then please consider the possibility that this is non-recruitable. Is this really you know, atelectasis, so you're dealing with kind of a, a shred sign or a fractal sign that's not going to improve because that lung is completely destroyed. Yeah. So if you had an improvement with increasing PEEP, how quickly would you see it on ultrasound? Would it be quite immediate? Yep. yep. So the way it's been described by the adults, and this is something that I don't normally do. So what they say is you need a critical opening pressure. You go up, achieve that opening pressure, which means that you've kind of recruited all the way to the top. And really what you do is you then go back down again to kind of de-recruit. And really that gives you your closing pressure. And really what you want to do is you want to go too above that closing pressure to start off with. That's a rough kind of an indicator. For me, like if I start seeing clinical improvement, my saturations start improving, and actually I've started recruiting lung, then really I would probably sit tight and I wouldn't necessarily stay there, but I might come and repeat that lung ultrasound maybe in about six hours if I'm there, or maybe the next day. That's my approach in my practice. I'm just not as confident and comfortable doing it. And hence, so I'm not saying it's the right approach, but what I'd say to you is, I think that concept of making sure that your baby is going to tolerate this procedure is very, very, very important. And really having an endpoint which kind of says, well, it's not working, guys, what am I going to do to the normal lung? I think we need to bail out. That That's also very, very important. So I, I use this mnemonic. I'll be putting this presentation up. And really for me, it's deciding when I'm going to stop. What is it that I'm going to look at to make sure that this baby is not becoming more unstable? Being able to look at the heart uh, on ultrasound is very important as part of this. A lot of people will measure SVC uh, flow, uh, but actually we've moved more towards measuring RVO and LVO as markers in combination with doing recruitment maneuvers to kind of make sure that you're really maintaining cardiac output properly. Uh, I think that's a little bit more complex at this stage. Uh, Dr. Zaridin, you have your hand up. Yeah. Two quick, uh, quick questions. Number yeah. one, the atelectasis at a later stage, say a yeah. three, four the phase in a baby who has been ventilated, they, I mean, I'm just wondering whether that's going to be a pure atelectasis or there will be some lung damage that is not going to be uh, reactive to increasing I, or increasing I, pressure. I completely echo your sentiment. And that's what I would say to you, that this could be a collapse consolidation. These are deeper consolidations and there might be an area of lung that's not going to recruit. And that's why you need an endpoint. You really need to see whether, you know, a good example is, you know, non-invasive ventilation. If you were on a PEEP of eight already, are you really going to leave this baby on a PEEP of 12 because you've been able to recruit the lung to that margin? You know, that is the question I'm really asking you. And a degree of critical correlation and being cautious is, is really important. What it's telling me is that I might be able to recruit to that area. But the question is, 
am I going to be able to oxygenate this baby better by recruiting this abnormal lung completely versus the damage I'm going to do to normal lung by the recruitment, which is going to cause over distension. And this is the, this is the bugbear that I have with this approach. And hence, I'm saying to you that think of the clinical profile of the patient you're using this in. In a baby who's acutely desaturating with the kind of lungs that I showed you, the case, that would be a good case for me to use this in. But in a baby, say, who's on CPAP, who's in about 35% oxygen, who may be having a bad day today because he's upset and angry and not getting enough peep and has had atelectasis, it might be something as simple as, well, have, has the probe been in the nostrils enough? Have we got a good seal? Is that something? Do we need to focus on those areas of optimization before we think of a recruitment maneuver? And that is a very important aspect. Holistically looking at your baby so is, is quite crucial. I'm just going to mute myself, guys, just for a sec. So I have time for one final question. Uh, anything else? Yeah, I have a question. Yes, my So uh, sometimes in ultrasound, we uh, in even on X-ray, we do not see any collapse, but still we feel yep. that uh, recruitment is required or, or is typically in a case when the, we switch to uh, HFO mode of ventilation, oscillation. Yep. So uh, how do we go about uh, recruitment in that case without so, any uh, yep. obvious collapse? Beautiful. So meconium aspiration, can I just give you an example? So you yes. might on lung ultrasound just have a B profile. You don't have any consolidation. You don't have any C profile. You don't have any atelectasis. But what you've got is a lot of interstitial pattern, B profile, a whiteout lung. And really when you're recruiting in that situation, if that whiteout lung kind of translates into uh, an A profile or an AB profile, and you're seeing clinical improvement, then actually what you're doing is you're reducing most, what most probably is inflammatory exudate, secondary to meconium aspiration, and you're improving aeration. So that is one way of looking at it. Again, similar to congestive heart failure, you've got a baby who has got a complete whiteout alveolar interstitial syndrome. And really when you put the peep on, what you find is that you've just moved back now to actually more aerated AB profile but which still has a dominant B profile, then those are examples of non-consolidation based lung recruitment improving things. So I've only done a bit of the presentation today. What we're going to talk about next time, so as we go forwards, is basically pattern recognition and pattern correction. And that's where I'll talk to you more in detail about how you use different patterns to recognize lung recruitment. And that is actually much more relevant to your use of CPAP and non-invasive ventilation. That help? Yeah, that was very helpful. Thank okay. you. So I am really grateful, guys. I am going to have to go, but I hope today's talk was good. I think you all are doing fantastic work. I, I am, as I said, after the 15th, guys, we're going to move to using the OSAT tool. Keep presenting. I think all of you are improving. Think of the points. I think some of the summary messages from today, think of your depth, your gain settings. You may be able to get just as good images by reducing the depth. Uh, for those of you who are struggling with how you alter gain, spatial gain, tangential gain, uh, I'm not free Monday to Wednesday because my family is here, but Thursday to Friday I am, I'm on leave. And if you need help, I'm very happy to organize a bottom call with you to help you. For those of you who are on my unit, again, I'm, I'm always uh, there to kind of help and guide you and learn from you as well. So I'm learning from all of you all the time. All, all these images that you're showing me. Thank you so much and God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.